Welcome back. I'm Gary Parr, and you're listening to Fiber Talk, that twice-weekly podcast for the needlework artist. And our artist this week, Rebecca Dallimore of the Seed Madagascar Operation and Stitch St. Luc's. Rebecca, welcome. Thank you for having me. Oh, this is going to be a ride. We get to learn about needlework making a difference, a real economic difference. This is going to be fun. And we are sponsored by Sassy Jack Stitchery. And here is a word from Kim. This edition of Fiber Talk is proudly sponsored by Sassy Jack Stitchery. Sassy Jack's is a vibrant young needle workshop located on the picturesque Main Street of Weaverville, North Carolina. We hope you find a way to come visit us soon. If you can't make it to us, then visit us on Facebook or Instagram. We love it when you stop by and say hi, whether it's in person or online. Many heartfelt thanks to everyone who stitched our free download, Aussie Friends. We are overwhelmed by how many of you have taken the time to stitch and post this sweet little benefit for fire recovery in Australia. Please feel free to share this design with anyone you like, including guilds and stitch groups. We'll be tallying up all the posted and emailed finishes through February 29th to determine our contribution to two Australian charities working on fire recovery. Every stitch counts, and we so appreciate all of your positive energy, thoughts, and prayers going to everyone and every animal impacted by these horrific wildfires. Thank you for stitching with us to support our Aussie friends. If you haven't signed up for our winter online class module, Learning Stitches, please join us as we're just getting rolling. You can find the info on our homepage at sassyjackstitchery.com. We'd love to have you join us on this first of many fun and affordable online workshops. We truly appreciate you, and we really appreciate all the good things we hear and learn from Fiber Talk. We are super proud to be a sponsor of this wonderful resource of stitching goodness. Thank you, Fiber Talk, for giving us some stabby pokey talk twice a week. Kim and team at Sassy Jack Stitchery. Thanks, Kim. Always appreciate the sponsorship. And uh, listeners out there, please support our sponsors. They are what make this happen. Rebecca, we have Seed. There, there's so many versions of this. Seed, Seed, seed Madagascar, Stitch St. Luce. Uh, all of it, all of it helping, uh, families, you know, I was, I was going to say women, but really families in Madagascar improve their overall economic situation. It's, uh, just reading about it is pretty exciting. Let's start at the top. Okay. You're the, the corporate liaison officer for seed and the marketing sales coordinator for stitch St. Luce. Start with seed, seed, S E E D. That's your umbrella organization. So start with that so that we just get oriented in terms of how this all gets pieced together so that when we talk about what you're doing in Madagascar, it makes some sense. So see, what does SEED do? So our name is actually an acronym. So SEED stands for Sustainable Environment Education and Development. Um, and as our name suggests, we are a sustainable development organization and we work solely in Madagascar. Um, We've got a small team in London, which includes me um, and our managing director. And then we have a much larger team of about 100 people in Fort Dauphin, where about 70 percent of our staff are actually Malagasy. Um, Seed this year is our 20th anniversary. Um, So we have been doing the sustainable development programs in Madagascar um, for the last 20 years. And we kind of started with... um, the main mission of improving the capacity of individuals and communities in Madagascar to assist themselves with their um, situation of poverty. Um, And then it's kind of developed into sort of four broad platforms. So we work in education, which is school building. Um, We work in community health, which is everything from implementing sexual education into the national curriculum through to helping maternal health during childbirth. Um, We work on sustainable livelihoods, which is where the Stitch project comes in, um, along with some sustainable fishing. And then we have a conservation program which works on reforestation and protection of lemurs. So it's a very broad uh, range of activities that we get involved in. Um, But one of the things with Madagascar's situation, and for those of you that don't know, um, it's one of the largest islands in the world. It's also a global biodiversity hotspot and one of the most that's threatened by climate change. Um, 
the majority of the population, which is about 27 million people, live on less than a dollar fifty a day. So the poverty is is very extreme, um, and the relationship between climate and environment and poverty and health we've seen develop over the last 20 years. And so our programs try to complement each other with tackling lots of different issues in one go. Um, so that's generally what SEED do. Um, we are a very small charity. At the moment, our income is just under um, £500,000 a year, which in the UK makes us quite small. Um, but we have over 30 projects um, and we're looking to kind of grow over the next couple of years because the need for Madagascar continues to grow. Um, so SEED overall, we work on those four programs and Stitch falls under, as I mentioned, our Sustainable Livelihoods program. So that program in particular focuses on, on improving income, health, access to basically general human rights for people in the communities, particularly in the rural areas. How, how, do, we, how do we end up in Madagascar? Is it uh, the founder had an orientation there? What, uh, I mean, there's a... A million places in the world where this uh, many of these same uh, factors are at play. What what yeah. makes it Madagascar? So you're exactly right. Our founder went on holiday to Madagascar 20 years ago um, and was kind of exposed to the poverty and the situation of the people primarily. Um, he was completely blown away by the environment. He took a holiday that was probably not your typical destination at the time. Um, and he really wanted to see more of the life of Madagascar rather than the tourist's version. Um, and he just completely fell in love with Madagascar, the country, the people are some of the kindest people you will ever meet. Um, and so Seed was actually originally named as a faddy, which is a Malagasy word, which I think means yes, and was the only Malagasy word that our founder, Brett, actually remembered <laughs> from his holiday. Um, we have since then renamed ourselves to reflect a bit more of what we do. Um, Good move and, there. <laughs> and a, a further understanding of Madagascar. Um, so, yeah, it was really a personal passion. And one of the things that, that I find working for Seed, we have in the UK office, a steady sort of set of staff. In Madagascar, we rely on quite a lot of international volunteers. So the staff turnover is relatively high. Most people doing a year or two with us there. The one thing that everybody says is that when they go there, they just fall in love with the country. Um, so that is how our work started. Our founder went on holiday. He wanted to tackle some of the issues that he saw. Um, Moving sort of forward a few years, our current managing director, so our founder isn't with us anymore, he's retired from the organisation, but our current managing director went on a, a university research trip to Madagascar looking at various different reptiles and the same situation occurred again. He absolutely fell in love with Madagascar and when he'd finished studying, he looked for anywhere he could to work for Madagascar or in Madagascar. So is a very strong um, vibe through the organization that there's a very personal connection with the majority of our staff. Now, see, that's pretty exciting. So two people playing a central role, both having separate and, and like experiences. Ah, yeah. Yeah. That really, puts a, that really puts a foundation under an organization. It was interesting you mentioned sustainable fishing in my previous life as a marine aquarist and love of the coral reefs really uh that that one stuck out for me because that is that is so critical and of course with with global warming and all the damage it's doing and going to do that sustainable fishing really gets to be a a major mm -hmm. issue and in, in, uh, in our previous podcast we did several shows with people who were trying to make a difference in uh, uh islands where where fishing was the only income and yeah. uh, if they didn't catch uh, you know, what they caught for the day was their food. And so to, to have that uh, be part of seed is, is also of interest to me. Yeah. So our sustainable fishing program centers around lobster fishing, which, as you say, is the primary income and the primary food of a lot of the households in St. Luce, which is that southeast region that we work in. Um, and that actually ties very nicely into the sustainable livelihoods project that stitches because most of the husbands of the women that are involved with the stitch project are lobster fishers. So, again, this was part of why Project Stitch St. Luce was set up is because 
the income that the men were making from lobster fishing was slowly reducing over time due right. to unsustainable fishing techniques. Yeah, well, and that's that's just it. That's the story that, that I've heard time and time again is is the real education is the sustainability. You have to help them understand because so many other outside forces are, are taking their livelihood right out from under them. And uh, understanding how to fish and how not to fish are, it gets to be pretty important. How did you get involved in seed? Now, this is uh, slightly interesting. I, I fell into seed, I must say. Um, <laughs> okay. <laughs> So my background is in environmental management and sustainability consulting. So, you know, I I left university, I moved to London in the UK and started working for an organization that was helping businesses tackle their environmental footprint. I was there for about four or five years and was specifically working with companies who wanted to reduce their carbon footprint. And part of that involved um, connecting them to reforestation projects and such things that reduce carbon from the atmosphere. Um, I eventually found that I wanted to be slightly more involved with the project side of things. I wanted to be more part of the solution rather than just advising. So Mm -hmm. um, I left that company without much of a plan, I must admit, um, and found a job that was advertised for seed that was for the stitch embroidery project. And in my consulting job, I'd done a little bit of marketing and talking about sustainability. So I saw this marketing job for seed that was one day a week, um, working just on the international marketing side. So running an Etsy store and working with boutiques for this stitch project. And I went into the office for my interview. Wait, which wait, wait, wait. Is... So, so you, leave, you leave a full-time job for a one day a week job. Yeah. <laughs> That's gutsy. <laughs> yes, it did feel a bit like that at the time, I must admit. <laughs> I, I had what I like to call probably a quarter life crisis. <laughs> um, <laughs> to be completely honest, one of the main reasons that I left was I found myself working with organizations who were amongst other fluffy words essentially asking me how much they had to pay to say that they were doing the right thing oh, um, yeah okay so I wasn't feeling so good about it anymore um and you can try as hard as you like to convince some of those companies that actually the right thing to do is not just pay for saying something <laughs> it's actually to do something um but there's also only really so many times you can do that to yourself right so yes that is that's why I was looking for something slightly different um and so seed just kind of ticked all my boxes as soon as I started I was surrounded by three or four people in the UK office who were clearly so passionate about everything they were doing um on my first day I was thrown into a Skype call with the stitch team over in Madagascar which was both um international staff and Malagasy staff um and everyone was just so keen to make the projects work and gain exposure for the organization that it felt completely different to my my previous job so that's kind of how I fell into it and I was supposed to be there for 12 months on a fixed term contract and I've been there nearly three years now okay you connected (laughs) you connected that's yeah that's um uh that's yeah that's interesting and I I I feel for you on that uh, working with companies that just want to say the right thing and Mm -hmm. uh and not do it the um uh, when I uh, was editing a an architecture magazine and the whole sustainability for for buildings, sustainability and green construction for architecture and energy saving and all that came along, we called that greenwashing. Where, oh yeah, yeah. Everybody's green, but if you look more than a layer deep, no, they're not. They're just they're just talking about it. And um, yeah, yeah. So I can I feel that that need to actually deal with people who are are actually care and, and are making mm-hmm. a difference yes so so you your your first thing is a call to madagascar you'd never i assume you've never been to madagascar at that point no i hadn't and i actually still haven't i must be honest about that um, oh really oh i was gonna ask you yeah <laughs> <laughs> uh my my greatest experience of madagascar is being on the other end of a skype video call <laughs> um <laughs> But no, I'm I'm hoping to go out later this year um, as kind of part of the other roles that I, I do for Seed. But, you know, I've, what kind of feeds into that is I've never 
although the work I do is talking about Madagascar and of all of our projects, the teams on both sides work very closely together. Um, and we're extremely careful about what we spend charity funds on. So if there's not actually a need for me to take that long haul flight out to Madagascar, then it's something that we kind of prioritize other staff doing. Yeah. Well, I, ha I have to admit when, when this came up, I, I generally knew where Madagascar was, but I hauled out a map. I got, <laughs> I got to figure out exactly where it's at. And I was pretty close, so I felt good about that. But, uh, uh, yeah, that is a haul uh, for you or me, either one. Yeah, that's yeah. It's, that. it's a long trip, and particularly because Seed is based in one of the very rural south regions, it will probably take you nearly three days to get there. Yes. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. Yeah. So talk about then Stitch. So how does Stitch get started? What, uh, yeah, yeah, what are its origins and, and – how does it, you know, what is the story? How does it get to where it is today? So Stitch truly began uh, about six or seven years ago um, when a lady called Sarah Brown, who was an art lecturer in the UK, went on holiday to Madagascar. So you'll see the similarities here yes. already with our founder's yeah. <laughs> story. Um, she was really shocked by the poverty she saw. But one of the main things that um, she was concerned about and that she felt like she wanted to improve was the lack of purpose and the lack of opportunities that women in particular had. So Sarah, although she was an art lecturer, is very crafty, um, an embroiderer. And so she came up with the idea that she would be able to train women in embroidery, tacking on to some of their existing traditional skills um, and be able to kind of turn it into an income stream. She had the idea, but didn't really have any idea about how to make it happen. Um, and so if you are in the southeast of Madagascar, almost everybody has heard of SEED, even though we're only a small organization. We've been so active in the south for such a long time that somebody somewhere will be able to connect you to us. Um, so Sarah worked kind of in partnership with the SEED team at the time and put together the proposal for the STITCH project. So Stitch started as most charity projects do, which is by the organization finding external external funding. Um, we've had a couple of really lovely, consistent funders over the last six years who have kind of enabled the project to grow. So it started with the onboarding of nine women who kind of opted in to some embroidery training. Um, and then... Throughout that first year, they were taught to embroider some sort of traditional products, so wall hangings that had traditional stories on, um, but also some things that would more likely sell in town in Madagascar, but also internationally. So Sarah kind of had this view that eventually we'd be able to grow and expand this into a market where people would you know, be appreciating artists and crafts, and, and she was completely right. So those first nine women were taught the basic embroidery skills, um, but also to make little purses and cushion covers. Now, this, this interests me, well, on, on several fronts, but I, there has to be a sensitivity, I would think, to uh, traditions and practices uh, of of the uh, native people. Mm -hmm. I, I assume that 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 became a factor. How, how does the, because you you can't just charge in and, and introduce Western values uh, to you know to people who live off of the land for all intents yeah. and purposes. Must have been some yeah. real sensitivity there. Yeah, you're absolutely right. So whenever we start any project, um, we always do what is called a needs assessment. Um, so this is basically like a, a research project that discovers what is actually needed, whether the community would be engaged if a solution was available, um, and whether it would be something that they would be able to do and willing to do on their own. So before we start any project and Stitch was the same, you kind of do those um, sort of group sessions, you research by talking to people, and, and the benefit of us having such a high percentage of Malagash staff is that we've got that link between us and the community that sometimes for other organizations isn't so strong. It means that we've got firstly staff who can say, we don't think that you should ask them anything like that, or these particular topics are sensitive. You shouldn't go in there and do that. But it also means that they have the, the capability of engaging with the community before seed takes that step in. Um, 
so yeah, you're completely right. It's there is there are particular sensitivities, um, and that's why we had such a small group of women join the project to start with. It was a very small sort of sample group of women who were interested in learning a new skill, and at that point, it wasn't promised that it would go anywhere or develop into a brand. It was more um, establishing whether there was a need, an audience, and whether the women would be happy to do those things. And one of the key things that we have stuck to from the very beginning is that the women own the creative creativity of Stitch. So whilst we have done product development sessions that have led to these little purses and cushion covers, which although are also used, you know, in Madagascar, but are particularly popular internationally, um, every single design is designed by them. And as you can probably see, if you've had a chance to look at any of our, our websites, oh, yes. um, everything <laughs> is inspired by the environment, by their local stories, by surrounding people. Um, so yeah, we wanted to maintain that kind of local traditional inspiration whilst being able to channel those skills into something that would help them. Well, see, that's really encouraging to me because uh, uh, we were talking beforehand and, and uh, uh, Claire Hunter, who did wrote a book, Threads of Life, which I recommend to everybody on the planet, um, more than one story in her book about cultures that had their needlework their clothing designs you know all the colors those kinds of things wiped out by people who came into their country and yeah, yeah. and uh, in a couple of instances literally lost their their connection with the past and so yeah. when when these kinds of projects come up that's one of the primary questions i have is what sensitivity was there to the history and the culture such that it is part of this project as opposed to shoved aside for something else. Yeah, I agree 100%. And I think it's something that, you know, the people who are involved in projects like us should be asking and, and we are asking. But I think it's also something that the consumer can ask. Um, I'm on the side of this very interested in sustainable and ethical fashion and how clothing is made um, because I know there's a lot of women artisans and women creators involved in that supply chain globally and I think particularly with the embroidery it's been I don't know about over there but it's been very trendy in the UK for probably the last two years you see appliques and you know embroidered jeans and jackets and everything and you just I think it's a very important question as a consumer to ask you know where did this come from and if you're buying it from an artisan organization did they design it themselves um, and we've seen a couple of cases in Madagascar where there's been similar projects to Stitch. So there's been groups of embroidering women um, and they've basically been presented with a catalogue of Western designs and asked to copy them. Yeah. So for me, that, that brushes the line with almost sweatshop culture because yes. it, it loses its creativity. And like you say, it loses the past and the history that's behind those skills in the first place. Yes. Yeah, and see, and that yeah, that bothers me greatly because these people, uh, well, people uh, anywhere have a, a long, long culture and history, and that has to be preserved and made a central element in in these efforts because that's them. And and boy, I just hate seeing people lose that. It's yeah. uh, it's and 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 not only them, but their children and their grandchildren. You know, that all needs, that's their history. That needs to be kept, it needs to be part of their lives. And uh, yeah, that sh here, here's a catalog, stitch these. Well, that's yeah. not, yeah, that doesn't work. Yeah, I struggle I with agree. that. Yeah, I do. So you have these, this small group of rebels who are willing to give this a try. How, <laughs> how does that evolve? <laughs> So it evolved <laughs> yeah, you, you can see it. Yeah, they're, they're the group. <laughs> yeah, yeah, let's try that. Why not? <laughs> they definitely were. They definitely were. And one of those first members of that group is our longstanding president of the cooperative. Um, and she's very much the matriarch of the group. Um, if you get a chance to look on our, our website, if you look for Estheline, the president, you will be able to see exactly that she is one of those rebels. Yes. Um, oh, you can see it in the eyes, <laughs> right in the picture. You can see it. In yep. the eyes and the smile. <laughs> yep. <laughs> um, so, yeah, it, it evolved fairly quickly, actually. So there was nine women in the first year. They went through the, the training under Sarah, who was actually on site for the project. 
Um, the following year, there were a few sort of rumours around St. Luce about expanding the project. And there were quite a few more women who, who showed interest. So there was another 12 women joined in the second year of the project. Mm. Um, so they went through the same sort of training programme. We devised a specific training which was everything from basic needlework right to through to some of the embroidery techniques and they got a certificate of completion at the end so we made it very official right from the beginning okay let me let me back you up on that the the obviously the the madagascar women uh, have probably i'm sure sewn things throughout their history in one way or another what yeah. what is the training here that that is i've got clearly different from uh sewing clothes yeah so the training here was to be able to translate a picture in their mind into a design okay um, which i think is something you know that most of us would would potentially struggle with when starting at the beginning i know when i learned to sew i had all these grand ideas about what i would make and i never used a pattern i ended up putting in pockets upside down and legs <laughs> on the wrong way around so um something my mother exasperated at regularly um <laughs> So, yeah, here it was more, there were some women who hadn't done any particular sewing um, in a community and particularly in the rural communities of Madagascar. They're, they're very close and they work together on a lot of things. So people tend to have different responsibilities within the community. So the, the initial training was everything from the basic sewing techniques um, through to some of the embroidery stitches, very simple crosses and stars and things like that. Um, that enabled them to sort of build basic patterns rather than sort of jumping straight into trees and lizards and those kind of things. <laughs> um, but we also brought in, with thanks to the funding of the project, a hand-powered sewing machine. So St. Luce is a village without electricity. Um, so all of the work is done by daylight and by hand-powered sewing machines. So there was, there was basically technique training um, and then a little bit more about um, using the different fabrics. So we trialed a couple of different fabrics in the beginning. Um, so we generally tend to use sort of recycled cotton now as a base fabric. Um, and then the embroidery threads are also bought on the local market. So it was fairly simple training and some people picked it up really quickly. And now we have some of the embroiderers are just absolutely fantastic. Um, so we found that some of the embroiderers picked it up quite easily, whereas others were a little bit slower and focused more on kind of like the linear sort of patterns and techniques. Mm -hmm. yeah. So by the end of the first two years, we had uh, about 20 women involved. Um, and from there, the project, we'd built the studio in the second year. So we had a place for the women to come together. Um, and by building that studio... Okay, all right. this... no, sorry, I got to interrupt you. I got to back you up again now. So so we have this project started. Our, was, was the orientation and, and the plan to uh, sell these things right out of the gate, sell these products right out of the gate? Or was this uh, learn this new skill and then introduce actually selling it later how did that play and then were people just meeting in the in the courtyard or how, how was the what was the original arrangement for uh, this work so the original plan was to a little bit of both. So to teach techniques and, and encourage women to, to try a new skill with the goal of potentially being able to sell it. Um, the studio is in an area that's quite close to some of our other projects. So, for example, the Lobster Fishing, the studio is right near the coast. Um, so we had volunteer programs going out for seed where people would visit the project. So it was kind of a, a, a thoroughfare anyway. So people would be passing where we located the studio. So oh, okay. there was the goal to eventually grow and be able to sell. But at the same time, things were on, on option for volunteers coming through who might like to purchase something. So it was very informal to start with. But the goal was always that the cooperative was the, was the kind of aim of the game and that the studio would, would come and find a place for people to be able to come together and do the embroidery and build that sense of community amongst the women. So it was, it, and I'll be quite honest, it really was a test. We hadn't done a project like it before. We weren't sure what the uptake was going to be like. We weren't sure whether the sales were actually going to make anything, particularly as we were competing against some of these other organizations that were producing designs that were much more appropriate for tourists and for, for out 
um, exporting to other countries. Mm-hmm. Um, but we were always very fixed on that we wanted Stitch to be unique and we wanted it to be a creative place. So we were kind of testing things out at each stage and, and that was something that the community were very aware of. So, you know, having that small number of women who were willing to try it to start with it was great for us because it meant we had a kind of willing audience. Um, so, yeah. So and and how, 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 sorry, I, I have these questions. I can't help it. That's totally fine. How, how did how did this fit into their daily lives? I mean, they, they, they have chores and functions in the community how did this fit in? Was this a spare time thing? Did they say, all right, this is this is a job for me. I, you know, I'm volunteering. I'm going to get involved in this. It's effectively giving me a job, and I'm committing three or four hours a day. How did that fit into their daily lives? So Stitch was and still is very much a spare time thing. Um, okay. As you say, the women have various responsibilities within the household and the community, Um so Stitch was something that could fit around those responsibilities. It was kind of a side hustle, if you like. Okay. <laughs> um, so, so yeah, and, and Stitch still functions that way. So the, the way um, the sales model is set up, if you like, is each woman purchases her own fabrics and threads from a local market. Um, she chooses which products to create from kind of like the set sort of set of products that we have. Um, and then as and when they're sold, um, they have set like the base price for their items. So they've agreed between the cooperative what they would charge for a bracelet or a purse or a cushion cover, depending on how much embroidery it has. Um, and that price that they give us covers their own cost of materials, the amount of time it takes them to make their product. And then a small percentage of what they earn goes back into the cooperative. Um, so that helps them maintain the studio. It helps them pay for servicing of the sewing machines. It helps them pay the studio mobile phone bill. Um, so essentially, it's very flexible. So they do it in their spare time and they can choose as and when they come to the studio. Obviously, they own their material so they can do it at home if they like. But it's actually the studios become a place where they like to go and do their work and work with other people. Yeah. Um, so their income fluctuates depending on how much time they put in. So it's really been a decision on, on their part of how many hours will I do this week um, because that will reflect on the income. Um, so it's always been, it's never been a job. Um, it's always been something that's you know up to them of how much time they want to spend on it. But then, and, and all of this is happening. So, so they're basically they're learning to run a business. Uh, yeah. Uh, but, but all of this is happening with their complete input, you guys are not dictating them. This is how you'll do it. Uh, they, they are they are making the decisions. They are putting this together. Yeah. So we had an outline for what we'd like the project to achieve, and those goals were not focused on income or anything like that. They were more focused on impact on the community increasing um, sustainable livelihoods. Um, so uh, we had very kind of charitable aims of the project. Um, as part of that, we hired a Malagasy member of staff, Paula, who was essentially the project assistant. And she was kind of our go-between between, between the, the goals of the Stitch proposal, if you like, and what the women were learning and what they wanted to do. So whilst we had recommended in this proposal that it would be good for them to have um, finance training, for them to have English lessons, those are things that we provide as a trial initially. And then beyond that, it becomes a decision of the cooperative members. So if I just kind of tack back to the third year of, of the project, in the early parts of that third year, we realized that some of the embroiderers that had been officially trained were starting to informally train other members of the community and had kind of set up their own commission model. Um, and it's not something that we'd encouraged or talked about or anything, but they had basically realized the more they make, then the more they've got to sell. Mm -hmm. So some of the women had started, you know, giving projects to other women in the community and taking a proportion of the sale money, um, which was great. <laughs> absolutely brilliant for us because it meant that we could kind of see the success of the project right because for them to be talking about it and growing it on their of their own accord we then realized that it was actually something that had the potential to be sustainable and it was something that the community was accepting of in your sustainable mind that's just perfect yeah 
absolutely yes. perfect. Oh, yeah. excellent. <laughs> yeah, and it kind of, for me, that that kind of validates the project. You know, it. I think it's with some charity projects, like you say, organisations can potentially roll in and you know bark orders or implement something but not engage with the community and that's something that seed has has never done community and education have always been at the core of every project that we do um, but i think that for this kind of informal training that was going on with stitch it was the perfect example that we'd actually we'd, we kind of got it right and that we weren't crossing any kind of traditional barriers or anything like that um so essentially what happened after that is we officially took on the majority of the other women who had been informally trained in the cooperative grew to about a hundred. Oh um, no, really that many. Oh. Yeah. Which was great. The studio had enough room for that many, but it meant that we then were scaling up the activities of the project and that it did have the potential to kind of transform into more of a cooperative than just a group of artisans, if you like. At that point, we then had some kind of senior members, which we called the business members, which were the original women who had been trained. And um, we went through with both the new group of women and the original on how they would like to structure the cooperative mm -hmm. um, in terms of who had responsibilities, um, who would manage the sales. So we looked at having sort of two tiers of members, which they decided they would like to do and elected a president, which is Esteline. Um, and then that gave us really a platform to kind of engage with the cooperative, with somebody having responsibility of saying, yes, we'd like to carry on with the English lessons, but no, we don't need teaching anymore on the sewing machine. So it really became kind of like a two-way conversation where we'd sort of worked out what activities would be useful for the cooperative to have and what training that they potentially might need to help it grow and to help them engage with tourists um, and then they would feed back to us on what they felt confident doing what kind of skills that they would like to have um, and it's been various different things over time simple things you know like it, using English language to say hello and goodbye to tourists coming through the studio um, to be able to use their sales skills to be a bit more persuasive so, yeah, it's really been a collaborative effort between us and the community um, and all of the women that were involved in what has kind of shaped the journey of Stitch to where it is now. And it sounds to me like this evolution is really giving you guys a way to uh, to back off where you're not needed and still play yeah. a role where you're needed and, and uh, give them a, a, a true sense of ownership then. Yeah, completely. So... Um, I joined Stitch in the summer of 2017, which was the first time that they had taken on an, a member of staff that wasn't in Madagascar. Um, and it was agreed that we would really test the market for exporting, selling on Etsy, going to market stores here in the UK um, to see whether there was kind of an appetite for it internationally, because that would really change the volume of income that was coming into the studio. From there, people went wild. <laughs> <laughs> they absolutely loved the products on our Etsy store um, and it's something that I've been kind of nursing for the last couple of years and, and it's always the same people leave us such lovely comments about how beautiful the work is about how they love that it's inspired by the environment they love all the animals and the traditional patterns so that's really kind of fed back into our initial gut that we should be you know encouraging the creativity of the women rather than dictating you know what product types they should be making so the international sales side of thing really helped the cooperative grow mm -hmm. um and we actually had our last phase of official project charity funding end in october so for the last 12 months or so we've been working towards independence and Pretty officially now, the cooperative works as an independent entity of Seed. So we have one remaining contract between Seed and Stitch, which involves support from me on the international side. So technically, I am employed by the project and working on logistics. So the one issue that we do have to that international expansion with Madagascar is the transport of stock. Um, we've found in the past that couriering products can be slightly corrupt process and we've lost quite big volumes of products before. Oh, ouch. Yes. 
So that is something that in this support contract with Stitch, we continue to look at to see if we can work out some kind of logistics where we can safely track it. Um, but how we've been operating for the last four years or so is by volunteers or seed staff returning to the UK will just pop some bits in their suitcase. Ah. So it's not a particularly <laughs> sustainable method of transport. Um, so, yeah, so apart from those kind of two strings, the cooperative is completely independent. Um, they have completed all of their English lessons. They continue to work with retail partners that they've made in the town of Fort Dauphin. Um, so, yeah, we are just absolutely thrilled with where Stitch is now. Um, and it's come such a long way from that first trial period. Um, and for them to be independent of charity funding is brilliant. Oh, that's fantastic. Like <laughs> that's just fantastic. The the economic impact on families, I mean, people who are basically living off what they catch in the ocean on a daily basis, and now we have this other source of income, this other revenue stream. What? Yeah. How has that has that changed things? What what positive differences are there? Concerns there in that, in relative terms, they have uh, now a I guess, relatively significant source mm -hmm. of income. What has that done to, to them positively and negatively? How does that work? Um, so we haven't actually seen a huge number of negative impacts. Um, I think the kind of um, the growth of the project happening quite quickly helped sort of dissolve the huge amount of income that they were getting. So yes, of course, they were having an increased income from pretty much nothing. Um, but obviously, the higher number of embroiderers, which was, you know, a conversation that we had at the time of the expansion, means that it kind of dilutes the sales, if you like. So each piece that is made is hand, has a hand-stitched name of the lady who's embroidered it, and a little ticket inside with a unique code on. So Whenever a purse is sold um, by Esteline, all of the proceeds from that purse will go directly back to her. Mm -hmm. So um, although that it did cause a little bit of imbalance between those embroiderers who were producing really high quality stuff versus those who were just starting out, um, it, it has kind of balanced out over time. But having 100 women... Um, making sales has kind of meant that it's sort of balanced out the huge income from just a few women. Mm -hmm. um, but in terms of the positive impact, it we did some calculations and it, it's fairly immense. Um, so we estimated that about 1,500 community members are supported. Um, and there was some very interesting research done by the World Bank last year on the impact of um, enabling women to gain an income that you were more likely to see the income spread between the community and have much wider positive impacts than if it was a man making the income. I'm terribly sorry. Men, um, you know, men are such pigs. I'll tell you. you know? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, well, I, see what, I, I just find that that I find you know, so much of this just intrigues me, but see that speaks to it. You know, that's, that's so women, women are, are able to look at the bigger picture better than men and say, look, it, we can all be helped by this as mm -hmm. opposed to men, I want it all. Yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah. I apologize on behalf of all males. <laughs> I don't think it's all males, to be fair. Um, but yeah, we found the community impact of 100 women was reaching about 1,500 people across the villages of mm. St. Louis. It was sending um, nearly 200 children to school. So only one in three children in Madagascar complete primary school. Um, and that's due to three main reasons. Um, one of them is just the cost of schooling. So most schools and education, particularly in the rural areas of Madagascar, are funded by parents and teachers. Um, it's people in the community saying, we need a school for our children. We're going to have to pay for it um, because the government funding is quite frankly appalling and goes with a lot of other issues that politically Madagascar faces. Um, the other reason is that there's just incredibly poor sanitation. Um, so a lot of children are quite often sick with diarrhea and sickness, which means they can't attend school. Um, and then the third reason is just that the infrastructure isn't there. Um, we have a school building program which repairs school buildings and we have gone out to schools in rural communities where they're in broken down churches that have walls missing and mm. 
you know, education is so important to the rural communities of Madagascar and they know that importance that they will send their children to school in a building that's broken down for the sake of an education. Um, so for the women to be able to put money at the very least solving that problem for 200 children is, you know, incredible. And for me, education is kind of the cornerstone of, of alleviating poverty. Um, so so the, the wider impacts of having that income are huge. And quite a lot of the women have also said just the fact that they have a studio, a community place where it's just the women, they can take their little children along. It's given them like a real sense of their position within the community. So mm -hmm. there's a really strong sort of women's empowerment piece in this as well. And, yeah, and that's that gets to another thing that was in my mind is is that uh, women empowerment and then the impact on men who have have a long history of being the providers has mm -hmm. has that been an adjustment or have the men embraced it generally the men have embraced it so like i mentioned earlier they most the majority of the husbands are already involved in our project are at simba which is the lobster fishing project so their awareness of transitioning to sustainable livelihoods to generating extra income it, it is generally embraced um and we have actually had some interest in the husbands joining the Stitch Cooperative. <laughs> there we go. All right. Now we're making progress. <laughs> Which is banned. It is a women-only safe space. Oh, come on. Um, oh. But I wouldn't be surprised if there might be some <laughs> sneaky embroidery going on at home. <laughs> oh, that is so sexist. I'm disgusted. <laughs> uh, well, that's great, too. So so that so then then the overall seed... Uh, concept then is doing its job in that it's not a threat to one or the other. Uh, it, it's lifting everyone. Yeah, exactly. And I think that comes from the, the emphasis on the needs assessment and the community engagement at that very first stage. Um, I think those are probably the most important things because if you've got people on board and they understand what's happening and why and how they can get involved and be responsible for it. I think that changes the dynamic much later on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and now there's a, there's a studio. So there's, there's a physical building where supplies yep. can be stored and they can come and, and, and stitch. Yep. Is that, is that a separate building or are we sharing with someone? Nope. That's a completely separate building. So that was constructed as part of the project funds in year two. Um, so it was basically designed to be a kind of central area because the embroiderers come from several different villages around St. Louis. So some of them will travel to get there. Some of them are a little bit closer. Um, so it's a, a completely separate building that is comp just designed to be the studio. So inside, almost every wall is covered with the stitch products that are completed. Um, we've got a big workbench with the hand-powered sewing machines on. Um, and if you picture it's... Um, kind of like a, a wooden building with green shutters. It's very beautiful. I will send a picture so that everyone can see it. Okay. Um, so yeah, it's a, it's a really creative light space um, that is just for the women embroiderers. And, and gives them a focal point. You know, we did that. This is mm -hmm. our home. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. So since it's become more of a shop front to tourists and volunteers, they're very proud. They keep it very clean. Um, as I said, everything's displayed on the wall. So, yeah, it's become the kind of center of their their operation. Um, and there's there's always somebody in there. Mm -hmm. And and a tourism factor there in terms of people coming to see them do their work and 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 purchase product. So the tourists are quite a big chunk of the, the income. Um, so we obviously have our own volunteering programs, which involves going through St. Luce. Um, but there's also quite a lot of cruise ships that stop by and Fort Dauphin and go out to St. Luce. So the tourists is probably the main income for the women alongside other markets and retailers that they have in some of the bigger towns. Um, people can come and visit and make their own bracelets. Um, we also do sort of commissions while people are there so they can have lizards or lemurs embroidered onto your cap or your t-shirt. Um, and that's one of the parts that I think the women enjoy the most is being able to kind of engage with the tourists to show off their work. Mm -hmm. Um, and everybody who visits it says, I came home with way too much. <laughs> <laughs> well, and for the women, that has to be an incredible sense of pride. Yeah. Yeah, Absolutely. 
Yeah, that's um, and that's exciting just in its own right. You you have a place, you have a purpose. Mm -hmm. uh, you're you're making a difference. That's um, well, that's terrific. That's just terrific. So how how can and maybe this isn't even necessary, but I, I'm just curious. How can needle workers help? Is there a way for needle workers to help with this, or is there some other project that is uh, on the drawing board that could be uh, helped? Well. My managing Since director. Since I asked, <laughs> yeah, my managing director would shoot me daggers if I didn't mention our other projects. Um, no, so we always have projects going on. So it depends on your passion. Um, as I said, we work in lots of different areas. Um, in terms of supporting Stitch itself, the best thing you can do is buy from our shop. And I know the last thing that I want to say is go and buy our things. But actually, that income goes directly back to the women. So that is the Re very Rebecca. Best Rebecca, just thing. stop right there. I'll say it. Go to the Etsy shop. The link is in the notes for this podcast and buy there. Thank you. That and makes me and, feel and we, we have a hashtag here. Hashtag Fiber Talk made me buy it. If you get in trouble at home, just tell them Fiber Talk did it. I'll take all the heat. It's no problem. Yep. <laughs> Thank you. So yes, the Etsy so stop is, shop is the most direct way that you can support. Um, we do, although post-independence are slightly uh, more cautious about taking donations in terms of um, embroidery threads and fabrics, um, if there's any dead stock or, you know, spare um, embroidery thread that you would like to donate, then the best way for you to do that is to send it to the office, either in Madagascar or even better to the office in the UK, because then we can get it out with a member of staff. Um, but otherwise, the main focus is our other projects and one that is slightly related to Stitch and will be built on a similar model is a current project that we started this year called Project Mahampi. And this is another women's cooperative. Okay, Rebe uh, Rebecca, I got, I got, I'm going to interrupt you there before you start that story. All right, now, mm -hmm. you said that people can send, if they have thread or, or have uh, things that they would like to contribute, it yeah. sounds like the ideal spot is to send it to England to the to your address or where, wherever you designate and then yes. you'll handle it from there but now yes. now right. you know i i'm no different than any other needle worker i've got more thread and cloth than i'll ever use and <laughs> and people are willing to give so before we go any further let's let's define what it is that is uh that is needed as opposed to people just emptying their shelves sure so the most useful things that we will need will be embroidery thread. Um, as in, as in DMC, as in DMC floss. Yes, exactly. Okay. Um, so that is used the most often, as I mentioned earlier, normally this is purchased by the individual woman at the market. Um, what we do when we get donations of, you know, physical supplies is it goes directly into the cooperative and is split equally between the women. So that's something post-independence that we are slightly more cautious of, um, just in terms of divvying things up and making sure that it gets there, um, but also that their independence means that they should be sourcing supplies on their own and would they necessarily have got that without seed is kind of a bit of a tenuous link. Um, but at the moment, until I say no, we are still accepting donations of things because I, I think it's, you know, it's great to support the women still. Okay, so so in terms of instructions for our listeners, then I'll put an address in the show notes. Yeah. And they can send embroidery floss to you, to the seed operation in the UK, and yep, then perfect. let you handle it there. And so, you know, people could send a skein, 20 skeins, 50 skeins, with, you, you don't care. Yep, I don't and, care. And colors don't <laughs> matter either. Just so. Colors don't matter either. Yep, they're all perfect. Um, and if anyone does have any questions or want to check with me what we do need, then my email address is on the Stitch website. Okay. And I, I just want to make sure that, that we don't inundate you with, and I don't know if that'll happen, but, but I just don't want you getting boxes of stuff you can't use because that's just wasteful all the way around. So, sure. so floss, really, really, if we just focus on contributing floss to the cause... That, yeah. that's the biggest difference maker yes that would be great we go through also a lot of needles so oh, okay. any of those would also be greatly appreciated and now i got all right now what size do we care any size okay 
<laughs> so embroidery, embroidery or tapestry needles? Embroidery needles, please. Okay, sharp points. Sharp points. Sharp point, embroidery needles of any size, and DMC floss, any color, any number of skeins. Yes, please okay. and thank you. Okay, we'll keep that. That That's definable. That's Everybody can follow that, so we'll stay there. Okay, now <laughs> let's let's keep you out of trouble with your with your <laughs> colleagues. So talk about the new projects. <laughs> so the main project related to this one is going to be another women's cooperative, um, which is called Project Mahampi. And instead of embroidery, this is a traditional reed weaving project. Mm. So again, works in two different ways. One has the women's empowerment and kind of social angle, um, but the other is also sustainable reed bed management. Um, so at the moment, the women pluck Mahampi reeds, they grow in wetlands um, and they're woven by hand into mats and baskets and hats. Um, the mats are traditionally used in most Malagasy houses, so they're a very sort of typical item that you would find. Um, the hats and bags are more for the tourist market. Um, so this project, again, will be building a cooperative with a place for the women to work. Um, and we'll be including that kind of community education on managing the, the wetlands. Um, but we are still looking for any kind of funding for both year two and three of the project. So we've basically already started in the hope that we'll be able to gain those funds. But at the moment, we're capped at year one, which has been all of those baseline surveys, um, getting the women who are interested involved um, and starting to talk about how we bring them together. So we're in very early stages of the project, um, but it will be another one that's very much craft and artisan based. Um, so out of any of our projects, at the moment, that is my particular that I would really like to focus on to make some progress with. Um, but obviously, if you take a look on Seed's website, there are other projects that you can get involved with as well. Right. And so so this one, uh, the, the read and weaving project, then that is something where if people wanted to just write a check uh, to just simply fund it. Uh, right. You're, you're at that stage of, of its life. Yes, we are. Yeah. Okay. And and I'll also put an address for that or or something. So, fantastic. We'll, we'll so, yeah. So folks who are listening and want to help out with these causes, uh, in the show notes at wetalkfiber.com, I will put all the information that you need so that you can reach Rebecca and you can contribute to whatever degree you want to uh, to either project, either thread or needles or uh, funding for the uh, this newer project. So we'll 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 make that obvious to you. And, and if you want to contribute, fine. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I just, we, we can help. It's uh, this needlework community is, is very giving, very generous, and wants to help these kinds of causes. And so we wanted to make it, make it a possible for them. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Wow. What a ride, huh? <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's just hearing that story, though, to me, it's just terrific because it's done with the proper sensitivities to culture and, and, and the, you know, the people, and they're, they're not getting Westernized to become economic juggernauts. You know, they're, they're able to integrate this and make a difference in their lives without changing their culture. And, uh, I just, I really admire that. I think it's tremendous. Did I lose you? Oh, oh I had oh. a little bit of crackling and then it came back. Oh. Oh, I lost you then. I think I can hear you perfectly fine now. Oh, okay. Yeah, I thought maybe I lost you. <laughs> so so I'll just repeat that last part. Mm -hmm. what, what, the, what this says to me, I, I just really admire this effort because it, is offering, you know, it, it delivers to the people uh, a way to make a difference in their lives without westernizing them, without imposing other cultures on them. The sensitivity to me is just terrific and, and done the right way. And I really, really applaud and admire that. Thank you so much. Yeah, that's uh, it's just terrific. Well, Rebecca, thank you so much for the time and, and the story. That's um, ah, fantastic. Yeah, kind of warms my heart, quite frankly. So, <laughs> Thank you so much for having us. Yep. So um, that's, um, uh, uh, I'll put the links. It's um, the Etsy shop 
is uh, a Stitch St. Luce, Saint with an E on the end, Luce, L-U-C-E, is on the is the Etsy shop, but I'll, I'll have links for that. And, um, boy, applaud you guys. Terrific. Thank you for the time. Thank you. And thanks to Sassy Jacks for sponsoring this and everyone for listening. Mm-hmm.